Jonathan Ashworth. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I just say at the outset that despite our fierce political differences, that my dealings with the previous Secretary of State were always courteous, respectful and professional, and I wish him well in resolving his personal difficulties. Now, I welcome the Right Honourable Gentleman to his place and thank him for advance sight of his statement. He will find working with the NHS and social care staff both inspirational and rewarding, and I hope he will agree and make arrangements for them to receive a fair pay rise and not the real terms pay cut that is currently pencilled in. Now, today he has let it be known that July the 19th reopening will effectively go ahead. He told the news this morning that there is no going back, that lifting restrictions will be irreversible. Well, a word to the wise, Mr Deputy Speaker. I responded to a lot of these statements these last 15 months. I remember ministers telling us there was nothing in the data to suggest June 21st wouldn't go ahead. I remember children returning to school for one day before the January lockdown. I remember it will all be over by Christmas. I remember we'll send it packing in 12 weeks. Well, we've seen around 84,000 cases in the last week, an increase of around 61%. Today, we've seen the highest case rate since January. If these trends continue, we could hit 35,000 to 45,000 cases a day by July 19th. That will mean more long COVID. He didn't mention more long COVID. That will mean more disruption to schooling. For some, it will mean hospitalisation. And we know that even after two doses, you can catch and transmit the virus. So what is he going to do to push infections down? Vaccination will do it eventually, Mr Deputy Speaker, but not in the next four weeks. Now, I want to see an end to restrictions. Our constituents want to see an end to restrictions. But I hope his confidence today about July 19th does not prove somewhat premature, or even, dare I say it, hubristic. And can he confirm that by irreversible, he is ruling out restrictions this winter? And has he abandoned the plan which the previous Secretary of State and officials were drawing up for restrictions this winter? Increased infections will inf impact on the ability of, of the NHS to provide wider care. Today he has promised to give the NHS everything they need to get through the backlog. So will the hospital discharge and support funding be extended beyond this September? Or will trusts have to make cuts instead? And how does he define getting through the backlog? When will the NHS again guarantee that 95% of patients will start treatment within 18 weeks of referral? We know thousands are waiting too long for cancer care. So when will the NHS meet its cancer target that 96% of patients wait no longer than a month from diagnosis to first treatment? When will he give primary care the resources to meet the challenge of the hidden waiting list of over 7 million patient referrals that we would have expected since March 2020? And given the pressures on primary care, is it still his plan to press ahead with the GP data transfer? To be frank, Mr Deputy Speaker, if the, de if the department can't keep its CCTV footage secure, how does he expect it to keep our personal data secure? And will we see a plan to fix social care? Or is today's Telegraph correct when it reports that he, the Secretary of State, is of the opinion that we are completely the wrong stage of, par of a parliament to launch a new social care strategy? Is that really his view? And given the pressures across the whole of the healthcare service, Will he abandon the ill-thought-through, top-down reorganisation of the NHS that the previous Secretary of State was set to embark on? And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, given the recent questions of propriety around COVID contracts, he will understandably want to present himself as a new broom. Can he confirm that he will not use a personal email account to carry out government business? Can he explain why the Social Care Minister has been using a personal email account to carry out government business? And why was the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Innovation, the noble, noble Lord Bethel, using his personal email account to discuss the awarding of government contracts? And why did he have meetings with a firm that won a contract but not declare it? Can he tell us whether he maintains confidence in that minister? And isn't it time that that particular health minister was relieved of their ministerial responsibilities as well? <laughs> <laughs>